Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I was driving from Chicago over to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which means the most direct route, unless you can drive across water, is through Indiana, kind of around below Lake Michigan and back up, in, uh, back up to Grand Rapids. And so it's late at night, it's really, really dark, and I'm driving along, and I'm kind of in that you know, place when you're driving at night where you're kind of focused, but you're just sort of not thinking about anything, you're just kind of driving along, and all of a sudden, bam, bam! And the whole right side of my car just goes, jump, bounces up and bounces up. And, and, and I knew what it was. I know that the state bird of Indiana is potholes. And so um, I, I knew exactly what it was. I'm driving along, didn't see it coming. And I hit a big pothole. And the right side of my car just went bam into the thing and bam into the thing, both wheels. And then as I'm driving, the right side of my car starts going, buh, 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 buh. And it didn't feel like a flat tire. It felt like I had bent the wheel, which I had actually bent. The, it didn't, the tire didn't pop, but it hit so hard, it bent the wheel. It had to be replaced. And so I, I drove the rest of the way home, kind of bobbling along, looking for potholes, paying attention. Um, but I, as I'm driving, I'm thinking, you know, can't they mark that? Can't they warn you? Can't they tell you something? At nighttime, you don't see those potholes, and it's incredibly dangerous. And, and we're, we're starting a series right now that, that's, called, that's called Guideposts and Guardrails, talking about the things that protect us, that keep us safe. So I was thinking about guideposts, and I said to our team, can you find me a nice picture of, of a helpful guide, you know, kind of sign or guidepost along the way on the road? And they came up with this one, and it's kind of a nice one. Danger due to erosion, keep out, and that's the road, if you look up at the top there. <laughs> now, imagine driving quickly down that road in the dark when you couldn't see anything without a sign, right? without, without, without a guidepost there. It would be, it could be, it could be deadly. I mean, I could, I, could have, I could have died that night on the road in Indiana, had the car, had the tires popped, and I spun out of control. It's dangerous. The team also came with another, another picture. It's kind of a subtle one. See if you can see the sign and what it's saying. Uh, most signs are there because something happened. I don't really want to know what happened there. Uh, but, you know, be, you know there, there, there's, there's guideposts. There's signs saying, be careful. And we're thankful for those things. They can save our lives. But there's also guardrails. The guardrails are when we start kind of wandering, keep us within the bounds. And so I asked the team again, find me a good picture of a guardrail. Here's the first one they showed me. So yeah, I could, you could, you know, if, if one of those bikes slides, you don't want to whack into something, but better than that than going off the cliff, right? And then they found another one just of a, of a road I'd never seen before, but that looks like the kind of road you might want a guardrail on. That's, that's somewhere. Um, wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great if in life there were guideposts and guardrails, not just on the road, but just in life, in our relationships, in our finances, in our temperament and how we handle things, in our faith, in, in every part of life. What if there were guideposts and guardrails to, to, to give us the right path? Because here, here's, here's the thing. We all need direction along this, this road of life. And, and one of the beautiful things is in the Bible, right in the middle of the Bible is a book called Proverbs. If you want to find the book of Proverbs, I encourage you, we're going to be looking at Proverbs the next six weeks. If you want to find Proverbs, all you do is take your Bible, if you have a print Bible, and go back to the middle, open it up, you'll probably end up somewhere in, in the book of Psalms. That Psalms is 150 chapters long. If you go in the book of Psalms, you start turning to your right, you'll find Proverbs. It's right, right next to, to Psalms. If you have your app, you can open up to Proverbs chapter one. We'll look at that in a minute. But this, this book of Proverbs it gives a name for the kind of person who ignores guideposts and ignores guardrails. Over and over and over again, the book of Proverbs, it gives a name for the person who, who's warned and told and they ignore it. That name is this, fool. The book of Proverbs says, if you ignore the guideposts and guardrails that are out there for you, then you're acting like a fool. It also has a name for a person who sees the guideposts, who sees the guardrails and pays attention and follows them. That person is called wise. 
And again and again, the book of Proverbs, it says, the fool does this, the wise person does this. The fool thinks this way. The wise person thinks this way. The fool behaves this way. The wise person behaves this way. And if you want to find out if you're a fool or a wise person, just read Proverbs and ask yourself, which one applies to me? I'm going to actually encourage you to read Proverbs. That's our, that's our daily reading. We do a daily reading every day of the year. And if you do the daily reading that's in your, on your Shoreline app or in the bulletin or on the website, if you follow the daily reading for the next six weeks, you'll read through the whole book of Proverbs, all 31 chapters, at least twice. And you could probably go and do more. And, and it, it will be transformational for you. It will change your life. And in the same way that most of us will look at you know, signposts and guardrails on the road, and if it's dangerous, we're like, Thank you for warning me. Thank you that you said bridge out. Thank you that you said be careful potholes. Be, th- thank you that you give me some boundaries so I don't go running off the road. In the same way, when you read the book of Proverbs and understand what it says, you will start to say, thank you, God, for giving me guideposts and guardrails for just all the normal stuff of life. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for helping me stay away from the cliff and the edge and folly. For, over, for, for right about 3,000 years, people have been reading the, books of, the book of Proverbs. For about 3,000 years, people have been learning from this wisdom. We would be wise people to follow in their footsteps. And that's what we're going to be doing over this coming six weeks. If you ever think to yourself, man, I'd like to invite a friend to Shoreline to church, but I'm not sure what the topic is going to be. Will it be really practical for just a friend of mine that doesn't know me to go to church? This next six weeks, that would be one of those times. This is just down to earth, really practical where you read it and you read it and you go, I get it, I see what it says. And if I follow that, it can change my life. So if you have your Bible open to Proverbs chapter one or if you have your Bible app open, we'll also have it up on the screen. I wanna read the first seven verses to kind of lead into this. And I want you to kind of notice who this is for, who Proverbs is for and what it can do for us. So it begins in verse one, Proverbs chapter one. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, for doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise learn and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And then verse 7, important, sometimes under, misunderstood, but very important. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Lord, our prayer today and for these coming six weeks is that we will grow in wisdom that we will recognize and see your guideposts, your guardrails, and that we would walk the way of a wise person and not the way of a fool. Lord, open our hearts to receive what you want to say to us and teach us as we're together over these coming six weeks, seeking to grow in wisdom and become the people you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we learn when you start to read Proverbs, and you read really all of the Bible, that God loves wisdom. He offers it to us. God loves wisdom. He offers it to us and calls us to walk in his wisdom. God says, I want you to walk in wisdom. I want you to have the absolute best life. I don't want you going off the cliff. I don't want you going into some big old pothole. I want to give you direction for your life. So so listen and pay attention. And the Proverbs is almost, at times it's almost like begging us, please listen, please pay attention. This could save your life. This is so important. And then you ask the question, you know, who, who needs wisdom? And we all know the answer to that. We all need wisdom, every one of us. If a, per, if a person says, I'm so wise, I don't need any more wisdom, the book of Proverbs would call them a fool. fool. Exactly. Oh, I don't even need, I'm so wise, I don't even need wisdom. Because Proverbs actually talks about pride, not having a correct perspective on who you are or how you think or what you do. God loves wisdom, he offers it to us, and he calls us to walk in his wisdom. One of the things I do when I read through Proverbs, and since I became a Christian, uh, every year I read through Proverbs at least two or three times. Every year. And every time I go through Proverbs, I learn new things, and I get new insight to God's wisdom, things I never saw or wasn't really ready to understand or embrace. But here's one of the kind of fun things I do when I go through Proverbs. 
Because Proverbs will often say, you know, the fool thinks like this, the wise person thinks like this, the fool does this, the wise person does this. And, and it really sh- paints a picture of what a foolish person looks like and thinks like and what a wise person looks like and thinks like. So whenever I read Proverbs, here's what I ask myself. Am I showing up more on the fool side of the ledger than on the wise side of the ledger? And I try to humbly really, and there's times I'll read something that says the fool here, the wise person here, and I'm like, if I'm honest, I'm, I probably think more like or behave more like or talk more like a foolish person sometimes. Will you this next six weeks let God speak to you by his word and give you some, give you some guideposts, give you some guardrails? If you're honest and humble, every person in this room, in the family worship venue, and every person online will all find ourselves saying, man, there's areas where I'm not walking in the path of the wise, where my knee-jerk response is a foolish response. And God will speak to you and teach you and give correction in your life. Ask yourself, which side of the equation am I on? Well, let's continue walking through this first chapter. In chapter one, verse eight, and and what happens now is is you get this picture, and again, Proverbs is just so alive and so practical. This is something middle school kids and high school kids could read, and it can make sense to them. You can read it to your children and talk about it. It can make sense to them. They'll, They'll go, oh, I see what that's saying. But here you have this picture in the next part of the passage where there's a person saying to someone else, hey, come on, be part of something that just really looks like it's really good, but it's really pretty stupid and irresponsible. And, and, and does the wise person recognize that and resist it, or, or does the foolish person grab their hand and walk along? But what, just listen to the language here and what's going on. And when it says in, in, in Proverbs, when it says, my son, it means my child. That's a, it's a generic term for, for you know, my, my son, my daughter, my child. So when it says my son, it means my child. So verse eight of Proverbs one says this. Listen, my son, listen, my child, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. The point is they're bringing you wisdom. Verse nine, they are a garland to grace your head, a chain to adorn your neck. My son, my child, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. You have wisdom, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things. We'll fill our houses with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will all share the loot. Man, it sounds too good to be true, but jump in with us. This is gonna be great. Verse 15, my son, my daughter, my child, do not go along with them. Do not set your foot on their paths for their feet rush into evil. They are, sw- they are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. And now watch this. As it finishes up, it gives a picture of what really happens to these people who are deceiving and inviting you in to their, to their foolish ways. It says, these men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Wisdom says, be careful. Walk down that road and you join them in basically setting a trap for yourself. So there's times where wisdom warns us. There's times where wisdom protects us. You know, bridge out, potholes ahead. Be careful here. Don't go too fast on this curve. You can end up off the cliff. Wisdom gives us these guideposts and guardrails to direct our lives. And and, and so then we also see in, in the book of Proverbs, it gives wisdom for all kinds of parts of our lives. Proverbs gives wisdom for your business dealings. Proverbs gives wisdom for your, for your sexuality. Proverbs gives wisdom for your relational life. Proverbs gives wisdom for how you handle your temper and your emotions. It gives wisdom for a lot of practical life things. But when we look at this, we see that a big theme through, through Proverbs is wisdom for your relationships. How do, you live your, how do you live your vertical relationship with God and how do you live your horizontal relationships with others? And there is so much in Proverbs that we're gonna learn in these next six weeks about our relationships and walking in wisdom, not folly, when it comes to how we relate to God and how we relate to each other. And if you look in the Bible, you discover that God cares deeply about our relationships. God cares so much about our relational life. So how do you know that? Well, we know that because when Jesus walked on this earth, Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was God in human form. When Jesus walked on this earth and the religious leaders came to him and they said, Jesus, what's the most important thing that's ever been written in the Bible so far? The first first two thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament. They come and they say, what's the most important thing of all that's come before, that all the prophets that everybody wrote about? What's most important? And here's what Jesus said. You find it in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 37. And Jesus answers the question, he could have answered it in one word, relationships. 
Now, what's the most important thing in all God's word up to this point? And, he, and he, Jesus says, relationships. Here's how he puts it, verse 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Jesus says, here's the first thing, the most important thing. Love God, that vertical relationship. Get that right. Live that relationship well. And the second is like it, verse 39. Love your neighbor as yourself. So your horizontal relationships. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus says you can summarize everything that was ever taught by God with these two things. Get your relationship with, your relationship with God, have that live, live it right, and get your relationships with other people right. And that is the wise way to live your life. So Proverbs just addresses this again and again and again. We can ask ourselves this question, who can gain from the wisdom of Proverbs? Who is this for? Well, at the very beginning of Proverbs, here's what it says. If somebody is simple and young, they can gain from Proverbs. But it also says if somebody is wise and discerning, they can gain from Proverbs. The point it's making is, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, it doesn't matter how much you don't know or do know, we can all learn from Proverbs. That's my prayer for these six weeks, is that we commit ourselves to say, we're going we're gonna to read God's word every day personally, we're going to come together every week and be around God's word, and we're going to say, God, speak wisdom into my relational life. We can all gain from it. Now, one of the kind of stumbling blocks for some people is verse 7 of chapter 1. And I've had a lot of conversations with a number of you through the years here at Shoreland. People have come and said, I don't, this whole fear of the Lord. I don't get the fear of the Lord thing. We shouldn't be, you know, it's not, not like you see a mountain lion and go, ah, oh, and I'm frozen and terrified and I think I'm going to die. It's not that kind of fear. It's something very, very different. But, but the, the issue of the fear of the Lord, what is the fear of the Lord and why does it matter? Why should we walk in fear of the Lord? And we should. We should walk in the fear of the Lord. The question is, what does that mean? You know, what do we mean when we say, I want to live and walk in the fear of the Lord? Because Proverbs 1, 7 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's something about wanting wisdom, wanting instruction. That's, there's something, how, the way that connects to the fear of the Lord. Let me give you two definitions of the fear of the Lord that I think will help you embrace this as a good and positive thing. Here's the first one. The fear of the Lord is an overwhelming awe of his glory, his greatness, his holiness, and his power that drives us to our knees in worship, that moves us to actions of obedience, and that wakes us up to God's will for our lives. The fear of the Lord is this awe and this reverence and this wonder at how great God is, and that moves us to worship him, to follow him, to, to listen to him, to learn from him. That's the, it's the fear of the Lord that says, I am so stunned by the amazing glory and beauty of God that I want to live for him. That's the fear of the Lord. Awe and reverence. But there's another aspect to it. There's another aspect to the fear of the Lord. And it's this. The fear of the Lord is a shocking terror of how bad things will end up if we ignore his wisdom, his leadership, and his will in our crazy world. The fear of the Lord is not so much a fear of the Lord, it's a fear of the consequences that come when we ignore the Lord's wisdom. And that's why Proverbs says, follow the wisdom of the Lord. And we should live with that kind of holy fear. There's a story I've shared before with you, but it fits so well with this topic, I have to share it again. And I know some of you aren't here every week, and so some of you will not have heard this, but, but I, I had a moment in my life where I realized that I wanted to instill the fear of God in my three sons. Okay, There was a moment where I said, I want them to have a holy fear and terror of the consequences of something. And that was when each of them turned 16 and started to drive. Because I love my boys. And I did not want them going off a cliff. I did not want them driving crazy. And, and so I explained to each of my boys when they turned 16 that, that uh, they, they got to get, their, you know, if, if they got a car, Sherry and I would, would take care of their insurance. Through the rest of high school and college, if they worked hard in school, got good grades, we would cover their entire insurance. But here's, here's where I put the fear of God in them. I said, but, but if you get a moving violation or if you get, a, if you get an accident, it's your fault. I said, that's going to change. What's going to happen is your insurance will go up because you are a male adolescent driver. And your insurance will go up a lot. And then if you have a, if we have one ticket, one accident, what will happen is you'll pay for half of your insurance, the new, the new amount, the part that went up. And we'll pay the other half. And if you have one more ticket or accident, you'll pay the whole thing. So, two years of high school, four years of college, we gave them this offer. Three boys. 
That's 18 years of adolescent and young, young male driving. Take a wild guess in that combined 18 years of how many accidents my three sons had in that 18 years. Zero. They drove very slow and very careful. They drove under the fear of the Lord. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that, but, but it was a healthy fear, right? Now take a guess on how many tickets they got. One. One kid got one ticket. So when it happened, I decided how I needed to ramp up the fear of the Lord. And so, and so I went to his bank. We had a shared account. I went to his bank and I took out half of the, the, the insurance came in six month installments. So we got the new bill. It went up. It went up. Trust me, it went up. So I took, got the new bill, figured out what half of it was. I went to his bank. I took out that amount of money in $100 bills, crisp new $100 bills. I laid them out on the dining room table, all the $100 bills in a row, and the receipt that came out of his account that he'd been working hard to save into. And I sat down with him. I said, so, okay, here's the deal. I said, this is the amount that came out of your account for just this next six months. This will come out of your account every six months for your senior year of high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year of college. You'll, you will pay this every six months. But if you get another ticket or if you have an accident, you're, it will go up again and you'll pay all of it. And he trembled under the fear of the Lord. <laughs> and, and so then what I did was I just slowly scooped up all the $100 bills I folded them a half, I put them in my pocket, I said, I'll pay the bill, and I'll let you know what it caught next time you have to pay me that again. How many more accidents, I mean, how many more tickets do you think he got in the next four and a half years? Zero. Oh, you're a mean father. No, I love my kids. But I, but I wanted them, and after six years of just driving slow and careful and looking both ways, I think they kind of got a way of driving that's, that's, that's it's wise. <laughs> it's better for life. The fear of the Lord is that thing that says, I don't want to live with the consequences if I walk outside of wisdom. And God loves us enough to want us to walk with that kind of fear. So now the passage continues in Proverbs chapter one. And now it gets really interesting because now <clears throat> wisdom is personified. So wisdom becomes, it, wisdom is presented as if it, she's this wise woman speaking and calling people to pay attention. So she's wise and she's offering wisdom. She's calling people to follow wisdom. But I want you to notice in the passage what happens when people ignore her, she is not very pleasant. This wisdom, this wise woman, this, it's taken the, the voice of wisdom, takes a female voice, and she says, here's what I want to call you to do, but if you ignore me, it's going to cost you, and if it costs you, I'm not going to be a heli helicopter mom who comes and bails you out, okay? So now what? No, this is, Proverbs is just down-to-earth stuff, right? Verse 20. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. These are the most public places in the ancient world. So wisdom, she stands and she speaks. How long will you simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke and I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teaching. She's saying, just follow wisdom. Don't follow the way of folly. Verse 24. But since you refuse to listen when I call and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, she says, she says you know, wisdom speaking, she says, if you keep walking in folly, no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand. Since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, watch this, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. Then you will call out to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but they will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But now the positive note, but whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without Fear of harm. You go, man, she's rough. Man, she's tough, this wisdom, right? But you know, you know what wisdom is saying? There's a point at which when you make your choices, you live with your consequences. And some people say, well, that'd be harsh. But man, life can be harsh sometimes. And God says, I want to save you from that. I'm going to put guideposts. I'm going to put guardrails. I'm going to try to give you wisdom. Some years ago when our boys were younger, uh, some of the different moms of their, our boys had friends and, and some of the moms of the friends would come to Sherry and I and ask for parent, parenting advice and how do you handle this and what do you do about that? And there was this one mom who she just, whenever her son got in trouble, 
she would say, well, you're on restriction for two weeks. And like the next day, he'd be out goofing around playing again. And she just, you know, he'd kind of whine and complain. And she'd go, oh, I can tell you're sorry. You're not in trouble anymore. And just wouldn't follow through. She wasn't like wisdom, like, hey, you're going to live with your consequences. There was none of that. And so at one point along the way, her son did something really, really out of line. She called me. She said, what should I do? I said, you're the parent. You've got to decide. So what do you think? And she says, well, I think I'm going to put him on restriction for two weeks. And I had told her, if you put him on restriction, no games, no videos, no TV, put him to work. You know, make him never want to be on restriction again. So she said, I'm going to put him on restriction. And I'm going to have him do chores. And I said, that sounds great. How long are you doing? Two weeks. Next day, I see him skateboarding around town. So I'm thinking he snuck out. So I called her. I said, I just want to let you know your son's out in the middle of town. He's skateboarding. And I, you know, I don't know if you knew that. She says, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I put him on restriction yesterday, but then he seemed really sorry, and he, you know, he was so sad, and so I just told him he could go play, and he'd be done on restriction. Oh. And, I, and I thought for a minute, and I said, I said, can I tell you something? She said, sure. I said, right now, you are your son's worst enemy. I said, you are damaging your child if you don't follow through with the consequences you give. And she said a few choice words for me and never spoke to me again. Um, I think I was speaking wisdom to her. We gave a lot of time to that family and cared for them, and, 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 but she didn't want to hear it. Um, wi wisdom speaks truth, but there can be consequences. So, two things as we wrap up today. The danger of folly. Walking in foolishness, following folly, not going in the ways of wisdom, ignoring the guideposts and the guardrails is dangerous stuff. Folly costs us every time. Every time we walk in the way of the foolish person, every time we live in folly, there are consequences. Second, folly damages every relationship. You want to blow up your relational world. I mean at work, I mean in social settings, I mean in your family, every relationship. Just walk away from wisdom and walk in the way of folly. It will damage every relationship in your life. That's why we're talking the next six weeks about healthy relationships from Proverbs, from wisdom. And folly breaks the heart of God. Folly breaks the heart of God. God wants the best for his children. He wants the best for you. And when we choose the way of foolishness and live with the consequences, it breaks the heart of God. But he loves us enough to let us live with our consequences at times. Sometimes he bails us out, but usually he lets us live with our consequences. And, and so what happens is then in our lives, there's moments where we go, this is terrible. How did this happen? How did I get here? And when you have a moment in your life where you say, man, I've gotten in a terrible spot. How did I get here? If your first response is, somebody else must have messed my life up. Don't go there. First, look at God's word and say, was I walking in wisdom? Normally when we get, you know, I can't believe I lost my fourth job in four months. What's wrong with these people? Right? <laughs> don't they understand that I can't get up in the morning very well and I'm, and I'm always going to be late? Don't, don't they understand that I, I leave work early even though I'm not? Don't they understand my needs? What's wrong with them? That's not the way of wisdom. That's the way of folly. Look and say, what, what, what's my contribution to the problem here? Wisdom calls us to look at our hearts and our lives and calls us to change in the power of God and the power of Jesus. And then the glory of wisdom, the goodness of wisdom. If we pay attention to the guideposts and the guardrails, if we walk in the ways that the Lord sets before us, some things happen. Wisdom blesses and guides us. God wants us to have a blessed life, a guided life. And if we follow his wisdom, he gives us direction. Wisdom strengthens every relationship, starting with our relationship with God. If you walk in wisdom, every horizontal relationship will start getting better. It will. You walk in the ways of wisdom. And your relationship with God gets better because you realize that he's the source of the wisdom that you need. And you look to him and you cry out to him. And wisdom blesses the heart of God. Wisdom brings joy to the heart of God. In those moments when things are going really well and you get that promotion or you, get your, or you make that team because you've practiced and you've had discipline and, or you know, and great things happen, stop and say, look back and say, I bet you I've been growing in wisdom because it impacts everything. When your relational, relational world is coming together, for me, when, I, when I'm walking the ways of wisdom, all my relationships get better. When you see those good things happening, say, God, help me grow in the wisdom that you've placed before me. So this is the invitation for the next six weeks. An invitation to wisdom, to greater intimacy with God and to healthier relationships. I want us to see how wisdom and our relational world fit together. So we'll be walking through the book of Proverbs and we'll look at God's guideposts, we'll look at God's guardrails, we'll look at how the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus can help us walk in wisdom in a way that glorifies God and that honors him. And so Jesus, this is our prayer. We pray that we would grow in wisdom. 
We pray that we would, we would recognize your guideposts and guardrails in every part of our lives, but particularly, Lord, we pray for these next six weeks for our relational world to be transformed as we learn to walk in your wisdom and in the beautiful fear of the Lord that helps us make wise decisions and fear the consequence if we walk outside of your ways and outside of your wisdom. Lead and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.